everyone, good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can build a sustainable architecture. So to introduce myself, my name is Carolina Pascali Campos. I'm a software engineer at Nubank. I came from Brazil, so it was a, a long trip, but I'm really <coughs> enjoying here. I arrived on Wednesday, so I had some time to visit some places, but I'm staying till Thursday, so I hope I can see many more things. Uh, I love to talk about books, coffee and running, so if you want to, to talk to me after the, my talk about uh, all those things, I would be happy. And just to give an idea, I started working as a JavaScript developer uh, in 2016, and I worked with it for more than uh, almost two years. And now I work with Clojure, but I learned all the principles about functional programming with JavaScript. And when I started, like in the, in the first months, I just saw a talk by Anjana Vakil. I don't know if you see the, this talk about the functional programming concepts in JavaScript. It's amazing. And when I saw that, I said, OK, I want to study more about that. And I, then I just started doing those things in JavaScript. So I learned about the paradigms in JavaScript. So when I went to Clojure, things were easier because I knew the paradigm. So I just ne needed to learn the, the language. Uh, so just to give a brief introduction uh, of myself. OK, so what's the motivation of this talk? Uh, when I joined the bank, it was in January of this year, uh, I, I entered in a new squad. So it was me, my tech lead, uh, Marcelo, uh, uh, that joined the same day as I, a developer, uh, and our uh, PM. And OK, it was our first day, and our tech uh, lead just told us that she was going on vacations. And I said, oh, nice. Yeah, and it was a new squad, so we needed to create a new service. Uh, in, so uh, she said, she told us that the first week we we're going to have some discoveries about what we, we needed to do, and after that she was going on, on vacations, and then we needed to create a new service from scratch. Uh, and it was only me and Marcelo, and we didn't know anyone in the company, so we thought it was going to be like really crazy, but. A, a really strange thing happened because the smooth learning, the, the, the learning curve was really smooth. And we said, wow, that's strange because we, we didn't have uh, much support. We didn't work with Clojure before. I came from JavaScript, Marcelo came from Elixir. So we didn't know, uh, uh, we just studied Clojure for the test, uh, but we didn't know uh, much about it. Uh, and we were like shipping a lot of code to, to production like we are doing code and shipping to production in the first two weeks. Uh, so that was really strange. We were not expecting for that. And we had almost no guidance because our tech lead vacations. And we didn't know almost anyone in the company because it was our first uh, weeks. So uh, the purpose of this talk is that after uh, realizing that, after these weeks, we were talking to each other and we wanted to understand why this happened. Like, what were the things that made it possible for us to work on a, like we just enter a new company, we, we, we understand a little bit about the concept and we were like creating a new service and shipping code to production, why we were able to, to do that? What were the, the patterns? So uh, we were, we, I was trying to, to find, me and Marcelo were trying to find those patterns and this is what I want to share with you today. So just to give an idea about Nubank, uh, we, we offer a credit card product that's completely digital. Uh, it really is to, to use, and we are considered the best service of the industry in, in Brazil. Uh, last year, we were considered by, by Forbes the, the, best digital, the best bank, sorry, the best bank in Brazil. Um, we, oh, oh, sorry. We also offer a, a rewards product that when you buy things, you get the points and you can uh, just raise your, your purchase. And we also have now a, a digital uh, account that's really nice because now we can accept much more customers because before we were offering a credit product, so we can offer credit to everyone, but we can offer a bank account to, to everyone. So just for you to have an idea, when I joined a bank in January, we had six million customers and today we have more than 15 million customers. Uh, it's growing really, really fast. 
so we are more than 300 engineers. Uh, we have more than 300 services, so it's almost a service per engineer. Uh, we are more than 40 squads. Now we are, more in, we are in Brazil, uh, Argentina, Mexico, and we have an office in Berlin. Uh, this office is focused on, on data uh, science. But in Argentina and Mexico, we are uh, developing our, 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 our products. So we, like last month, we just released our credit card in Mexico. And we have more than 15 million customers. Uh, so uh, here is like distributed systems. We know it's really hard to, to uh, understand them and to have all this picture. And we have more than 300. So uh, not, I'm going to talk more in the code base level, not in the, in the conversation between them. But when you have like 300, you have to have some patterns. Because otherwise it's going to be really difficult to maintain all of them. So what I was looking for was these patterns among those services. So what are the things that are common that made us uh, that made us possible for us to work on it? So I remember in the first week we were just like open a lot of repos in GitHub and choosing okay this service looks good and this looks good and like we chose five and okay those are the source of truth that we're going to use, uh, but they were similar. We just chose some, but it was really nice to, to see that like after open 20 and 30, I say, OK, they're, they're really, really similar. Uh, we just need to, to select some for us to, to move. And what they had, all, the, all of them were using functional programming. All of them were really relying on tests. And all of them were using hexagonal architecture. So these are the patterns that, I've, uh, that we found. Uh, that were, were common between these 300 services. And those are the talks that I want to talk to you today. So first of all, functional programming. So the functional programmers, we, we borrowed this concept from math, the, the, those functions. And so when we are talking about pure functions in, in functional programming, we are talking about those mathematical functions. And the idea is that those functions are different from methods, from procedures, because in them you can do a lot of things. You can write to a file, you can read from a file. And when you have mathematical functions, you are in a much constrained uh, domain. You can't do those, those things. What you have is that you have this domain and you have the range. Like in math and in, in, functional, in, in programming, you are going to have your arguments and you're going to have the, the return value. Uh, so the idea that we want to, to get from the math functions is that uh, they are ref reference transparent. So if you, uh, you can just take off the, the, the call of the function and use the return value. Because when you have the, the same input, you're going to have the same output. And you don't have side effects. So that's the idea of the pure function, and it's the same as mathematical functions. Uh, and they are timeless. It doesn't depend if you're going to run that today or tomorrow. Uh, the, the result is always going to be the same. So we want to have this constraint, because these constraints give us power. And we decided to borrow this from, from math. The idea of, of uh, functions from math is the one that we use in pure functions. In, uh, in functional programming. And when we talk about functional programming, it, it's all about per functions. So just to, to make the idea really clear, you have the for the same inputs, the same outputs, and you don't have side effects. So you're not mutating any any state while you're doing that. You're not uh, writing to a da database. You're not sending in mail. You're not doing any of this. Uh, also about reference transparency. That's this idea that you can just. Uh, replace the call of the function with its return value because it's always going to be the same. So you know that, oh, when I call a function that does a multiplication and plus 2 and 3, it's always going to be 6. I don't need to have the call of the function. I can just replace with its result. So those things are interchangeable, the refresh and transparency and the pure functions. But it's nice. We, as functional programmers, we love to talk about pure functions. But the thing is, we need to talk about the impure ones. Because uh, we want to have a way to enter our program. We want to have a way to exit. We want to save things to the database. We want to write things to a file. We want to read. Uh, we want to get messages from a, a message queue. So we need to talk about these impure functions, because they exist uh, in, the, in our code. Um, so the idea here is 
since we need to talk about them, how we're going to structure our code, we need to think about them as much as we think about the, the peer runs, because we don't want to have much of them, and we want to have them controlled. Uh, so how can we do that? Uh, okay, so we need to talk about those side effects. We want to do them, we need to do them, uh, how we're going to do it. So uh, a really important thing to have in mind is that if you have a pure function and you are going to call some impure function inside it, it's going to, you, it, so you no longer have a pure function. So given that, you need to think in a way of structuring your code for this never to happen. So here I'm writing my pure function and if I call an impure inside it, I just lose it. It's not a pure anymore. So how is the code going to be structured? Uh, how is going to be my architecture in a way that I don't have any pure functions calling the pure ones, otherwise they would be impure. So I need to think in a way that I'm going to architecture it for this not to, to happen. I don't want to infect this pure, uh, my functional programming code with imperative code. So what I say is that when you have pure functions, you have functional programming code, and when you have the impure functions, you have the imperative code. And I don't want to infect my functional code with imperative code. So this is the reason that I need to architecture in a way that this doesn't happen. Here we want to limit the amount of imperative code. So one thing that I think is really important when you are writing your code and you want to be functional, you need to think that if you are writing a function that's not pure, it, it, like, it was impossible for it not to be pure. You need to think about that because otherwise, if you are writing a function that's impure and it could be pure, try to refactor it. Like, it's not that, I, I say like, you're doing it wrong if it could be pure and it's being impure. So try to think in a way to change it. We want to limit the, the amount of imperative code. And another thing that's really important beside the, the pure functions is to think about immutability versus mutability. And I really like this, this analogy. It comes from the book, The Joy of Closure. And the idea here is imagine that you have this animation, right? And you're like you're drawing uh, uh, this animation. So you, draw, you start drawing and then you're going to make a new draw. You just turn the page and, and draw uh, the, new, the new piece and you're turning the page and drawing. And that's really powerful because now the book is the identity. Each page is the state of your animation. And when you flip the, the pages, you are going to have the state in a given uh, time. So you know what's happening in, a, in, like, in that moment of time, how was my, my animation. So you have, the, you have the identity as the book, you have the state as the pages, and you can flip the pages and have the time. So when you see your animation, uh, you're just seeing, oh, how did I get to this end? What were the, the points that uh, my data get to? But the problem is that if you have mutability, the thing is you have your draw, and when you need to draw something new, you just, uh, uh, you're just going to erase something and draw the new thing. So when you look to the, to the final result, you have no idea how you get there. And what happens is that you just mix it, your identity with your state, and you lost the notion of time. So it's way harder to, to code like that, to debug code like that. So that's the reason that we want immutability, because it gives a lot of power for us while coding and while debugging things. Because now with the immutability, you know the whole story. You know how you get uh, into the end, and with mutability, you, you just don't know. So when you have the pure functions plus immutability, uh, it's like you have just a lot of power in your hands because it's way easier to reason about that code. Imagine that you can just replace the, the, the functions call with the, the return value because they're always going to be the same. You have immutability so you know all those steps that you, you went to, to get to the, to the end. So it's way easier to, to debug, you know, when things happen and what they uh, what they change it because they're just creating uh, new things. So it makes things really easier to, to debug. And that really nice thing here is that when you, when you try to understand your code for debugging reasons, 
uh, you just don't need to look through a lot of code to understand. Because the idea here is that with pure functions, you're not mutating state, you're not depending on other uh, functions changing uh, uh, other variables. So if you, if you look, there are a minimal amount of lines that you need to look into to understand what's happening in your code. Because you're not changing things in a lot of places. So that's really powerful. Uh, it's, uh, when you, you need to focus on fewer things, things get really, really easier. Um, another point here that we have in functional uh, language is the idea of persistent data structures because I just told you that we have immutability but you may be worried about performance because if I'm just creating a lot of new uh, objects, how uh, I'm going to deal with that? Uh, my stack is going to, to uh, overflow and things like that. Uh, in, so we, in functional uh, language like Clojure and Elixir, we have persistent data structures that they use this strategy of copy and write. Just for you to, I'm not going to go deep on, on it because it's a really broad subject, but just for you to have an idea, here uh, it's a code closure because uh, Clojure implements that. Um, and here's an idea when you add something new. So I just, uh, sorry, uh, I just updated something. And I updated the position here, and so I just needed to create some no, uh, uh, nodes in my in my graph to to point to the new, and I could uh, use the old reference for the things that are the same. So I'm not creating everything uh, from the scratch. And here's just an update uh, example. It's different when you're uh, adding. It's different when you're deleting. So I'm just leaving a, a reference in the end if you want to understand more about those persistent data structures. But they are uh, the things that make uh, us not worry about performance. We have no problems about it, but JavaScript does not implement that. So how would you deal with it in JavaScript? And there's a lib called immutable.js, and it's exactly what they do. Uh, they implemented the, these persistent data structures in JavaScript. So you can also uh, use them. And it's a, really, it's a really nice lib for that. So JavaScript does implement, but if you use this lib, everything is, is OK. Um, and with all this power, you can really focus on, on what matters because uh, those uh, fun you, you are, can be fast on debugging. You you are going to use per functions. You are going to choose immutability. So you are going to focus on your business logic. If things are really fast to to develop and to test, so functional programming really gives you gives you power. And another really nice thing is that you can eliminate shared uh, state. So order does not matter. Because imagine when you are uh, coding things and you are debugging things, when you need to, to care about order is like another thing that you need to have in your mind and you need to set up the things to in, the, in the right order so you can test and understand what's happening. But if you can eliminate it, uh, that's really powerful because we don't want our functions to be shared things with other functions. Uh, we don't want to run them and okay, but they need to wait the other one to, to finish because they are depending on each other. So it's really powerful when you can eliminate that. Um, there's even an analog analogy by Eric Norman that's also uh, really nice that imagine that you're uh, digging a, a, a hole and you are just uh, as many people as possible are helping you and we are not sharing the, the shovels to, to dig that row is going to be really, really fast. And that's exactly what we want in your code. We want to have like many functions being able to work in their pace, in their time, and they are not interrupting others. So uh, we can eliminate shared state. So it does not matter because we have those per functions that they just don't depend on each other. And what we want is to be as functional as we can to be able to leverage all of this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tests, but then I'm going to go back to the architecture to explain how we can architecture our code to be able to be as functional as, as we can. So OK, I talk a little bit about functional programming and all those powers and how it can make us move fast and understand things better. And, but another point that I found in our service is that we were really relying on tests. So for example, we don't have QAs in, in Nubank. We just deliver, like, if our tests are passing, they're going to produ production. We even don't, don't test things in staging. We have a staging. So if you have something that's really, really critical and we want to pause the pipeline of prod and test it in staging, you can. But otherwise, you're just going to do all your tests and push that to production. So we really rely on, on tests 
Um, and why uh, do we want tests? Because uh, we as developers, we need to be confident and we need to, be, to feel safe about, about our code. So we know that tests can give that to, to us. Um, and they also work as a live documentation. Documentation is a really broad subject and some people are pro it, some people are against, but it doesn't matter. If you're talking about tests, they work as a live documentation because if you change things, you need to change your tests. And if you have never worked on that code base and you're going to change that function, you are going to see the test for that function, then you have an idea, okay, if the, the person who wrote that function was expecting this, this, and this, so it's kind of the documentation for, for it and they don't get stale. Uh, and okay, we need uh, the feedback. When we are writing our code, we want to know if the code is doing what we're expecting it to do. Uh, but how can we check the quality of this feedback? How can we check the quality of our, our tests? Uh, and I spoil it here, I'm not going to talk about 100% of test coverage because uh, it doesn't mean much. So the first point that I want to talk about is about accuracy. So imagine that you are writing our test and it fails, right? So how long does it take to you to find the, the piece of code that makes that test failed? Uh, so the thing here is imagine that you have like a really big function that's calling another 10 functions. If your test fails, you don't know exactly what, uh, where it failed. But if you have some small functions that don't depend on other things, and that uh, test fail, you know exactly where it failed. It is really easier to, to understand if things are smaller and they don't depend on other things. So you have accuracy, your test fail, and you know exactly which function, which line uh, the, the error is, is happening. Uh, okay, you also want speed because okay, my tests are failing, but how long do they take to, to fail? I don't want to wait hours for them to run. And I also don't want to take a, a lot of time for me to write them. Because if I have a lot of dependencies and I, if I depend, uh, if I need to, to really create a state in my test to be able to test that function. So, okay, I need to test that function, but before I need to put all of the other, uh, all of all the, uh, all of the, all the other functions before in that state is going to take me more time than if I'm just testing one function. So it's also about speed of writing the test, not just running it. So I need them to be, uh, to be fast because I want to identify the problem as fast as I can. So the, the impact is going to be smaller, right? And here's a really important thing. I want to have a reliable, reliable feedback. I don't want to run my tests now. And when I run again, some tests fail and some tests pass. Okay, I'm just going to run again. Oh, now all of them are passing. Like, what's the point of having tests that I don't rely on? It doesn't make any sense. And usually we know when that happens. And it's with end-to-end -end tests because they can become a, a problem, especially when you have 300 services. And that was exactly what happened to us. Uh, we were taking hours to run our end-to-end -end tests. And it was not, like, not an option. I can't wait like, for hours or even for a day uh, to be able to release things to, to production. And worse than that, and when test fails for reasons that you have no, that you can't predict, they are going to fail because of garbage collection. They are going to fail because of latency problems. They are going to fail because of internet problems. They just fail for a lot of reasons that are not related to your test. So you just waited for hours to have this uh, error that doesn't make any sense for you. It doesn't give you any business contest. Um, and when you are in a big company or in a company that divides in squads, there's another problem because when you write, it, when you write an end-to-end test, usually you're going to pass like 70 services. And who is responsible to write that test? You, you just want one, one of them. So should you be the one responsible for writing it? So it was another problem. And we decided that we're not going to use end to end tests no more at Nubank because it was not scaling. And the decision was like last year, but this year we killed all of the end to end tests. Um, and for us, it was really important because things are, were taking a lot to go to production and said we need to have another strategy to, to test it because 
they don't, when they fail, usually they don't give us a good feedback because they could have failed because of these obscure reasons. Or okay, sometimes it was an error, but there are other ways to test it. I could like use canary deploys, just release to 1% of my users and release that today. And the, the um, price that I'm going to pay is way cheaper than waiting for one or two days to release that feature. Um, but we decided, uh, uh, we use canary release, but uh, despite then that, we said, no, 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 we are not going just to erase and change. We're going to add another layer here. And the idea was to just think only a little uh, bit larger. So before, we were like going up with 20, 30, 100 services to, to test something. Uh, and you said, OK, I have all the unit tests in my service. They guarantee that the functions are working. Now I have the integration tests with they are mocking everything, but they guarantee that the, all the flows inside my service are working. What's missing is the conversation between uh, the, the services. So we can just think a little bit larger and okay, I'm going to guarantee this service can talk to this one. And after that, I can guarantee that this one can talk to this one and not everything at the same time. So we decided to adopt the contract test. And the idea here is that we are going to have a producer and a consumer and the producer is going to produce a message and the consumer needs to be ready to, to consume it. So they need to have a, a clear um, uh, communication between them so, can they, so uh, they can communicate. Uh, here it's important to say that this is not a one-to-run -one replacement, to end to end test, but it added the, the guarantee that we needed. We needed to know if we produce something here, the other service is going to, to be able to consume. Because if it's able to consume, then it's going to enter the integration test. Uh, because we are mocking that, and the integration test is going to test all the, all the flow. So we were, those tests are really, really fast to, to run. We don't have any problems with flaky tests like we used to have in the trend. And for us, it was a really, really good replacement. Just a second. So with that, we have accuracy because we are using functional programming and we are using per functions. So things are isolated. Per functions always receive things via input. They don't mutate state. So it's really easy to, to test them and they are accurate. If they fail, it was the pure function that failed, not like a cascade of, of functions. We have speed uh, because Pure functions are really fast to, to, the test for pure functions are really fast to write. You don't need to set anything up before testing. And we also are not using any trend test. We are using contract tests, so it's, we can move fast. And we also have reliability because the only point that was not uh, making us able to have that were the, the trend tests. And why do we want highly testable code? That's really, really important because when you enter, uh, imagine that you, you are just onboarding a lot of people and that was exactly what was happening at Nubank. Now we have 300 engineers, but last year it was like half of that. So there are a lot of people entering the company and we really want them to feel confident to ship things to production. Like I, in the first weeks I was red shipping things to production. And if you are, uh, we, I, I, I was in the case that we are creating a new service, but we imagine you just enter the company and you're going to, to modificate things in a service that already exists. You are going to feel more comfortable if when you change something in the function, tests are going to break. Uh, you can even move more dependent because uh, you don't need to always ask someone, okay, what is this code impacting? What this function should do? Um, it gives you confidence to start uh, breaking things for yourself. And when you push things to, to when you open a PR, for example, at least you are at your test. You don't know if what are people going to say, but at least you have your test and you know they are passing. So it's really important for, uh, for a, a company to have uh, a lot of tests because they give, us a, they give a lot of confidence for, for everyone. And they, with, with that, you can move faster, and that's really, really important. So OK, I talked about tests, and now I'm going to talk a bit about how you can design your code to get the best of, of it. So uh, we want to design applications that are used to give maintenance and that have low tech depth. Everyone wants that because we want, to be we want to have things that are simple and easy to work on. 
And I, I think that's hard about maintainability is that's a long-term concept. So imagine us, we were starting a, a new service and we were in two. Uh, so we were creating the, the first files, uh, the first features, everything was so easy because you just have a few lines of code. You don't realize uh, if you're doing something good and really easy to maintain uh, until you get like 20 developers in that, in that service or when you leave the squad and new, peop uh, new people enter and when that code base gets larger. So usually you just realize how important the decisions that you made were after some time because when you have a lot of people working on it or new people or the, the code just gets really, really big, you realize that, okay, I made a good or a bad decision and if I want to change it, it's going to give me a lot of pain. So it's really, really important to think that since the beginning so you don't suffer the, the consequence in the, in the long run. And we all expect that all the code that we made is going to, to grow. So we need to think always about that. So the first attempt that we, we did for our architecture was the hexagonal one. So just to give you a brief introduction, in the hexagonal architecture, <coughs> We are going to have the domain model that's going to be the, the center of our application. And the idea here is that we're going to have all your business uh, rules uh, being modeled in that part. So here, uh, if you have like an accountability system, all the rules of accountability are going to be here. And think about those rules. They exist for years and years and years. So you don't expect them to change. And here you can model everything with per functions and with no uh, mutable uh, state. So this is why it's green, because here you only have pure functions and no mutable state. And here are the, all the business rules of your, of your domain. Uh, after that, you're going to have like your controllers. So imagine you're going to receive an HTTP request. It's going to pass through an adapters uh, layer. So the idea here is that, okay, what the controller expecting? I have an adapter after the HTTP request to make the data as the controller is expecting. So then the controller uh, receives it and going to make the calls for, okay, I'm going to call this, this domain uh, model functions for the, for the logic. Then I can call the database to save something or to get some data. I can call the uh, Kafka to make some messages. Uh, but the problem here that we, uh, is that it's not completely pure because as I said, we're going to, to call the database, we're going to call the, the producer. So we have some, uh, we are mutating state here, right? Uh, we are calling these imperfect functions inside our, our controller. And is the, in the third layer is where we expect to have all the I.O. So here it's completely okay to have all your imperfect functions. The idea is that they should only remain here, so they are controlled. And here is where you're going to receive this HTTP request, when you're going to send an email to, to read from a file. So all these things are going to happen in this third layer that's called the I.O. or the ports. Uh, and here is where you are going to have all those imperfect functions that they exist, we know they do, and they're going to be controlled because they are all uh, in this I.O. Uh, layer. So the, the nice thing about the exact architecture is that you can separate this business logic from the I.O. So as I showed you, you have the business logic inside your domain, and it's like in a shell, it's uh, safe from the, from the I.O. And that gives you a lot of power because when you ha I like I have a new feature, I know which layers I need to work on. So if I'm changing something in the infrastructure, imagine that I had an HTTP call and now I want to model that as a, as a message in Kafka. I'm just going to change things in the infrastructure code. My domain is completely safe because it doesn't know about those things. So that's the, the really nice thing about exact architecture. And the other idea is that you have test isolation with mocks and stubs. So what's happened here is that we use a thing called dependency injection uh, to be able to have these mocks and stubs really easy. So in our controller, uh, we are going to receive our database, we are going to receive the, the producer from the, the message uh, queue, all as inputs of our functions. So when we are going to test things, since they are inputs, in your test, you can just mock a fake database, you can just mock a fake producer, and send these mocks 
as, as, the, as the parameters when you're going to test things. So it gives us a lot of power because we are mocking things. But we don't really want to hit the database or really send an email to our customers when testing. So when you, ha when you have dependency injection, it's easy to, to change for the re-implementation or the, the mocks and stubs. And this is another idea that Exagon exact, uh, exact Architecture gives to us. So what was the first, uh, after all of this that I talked to you, what was the first discover that, that we made about this, this combo? And it was that some things that are hard in object-oriented programming can be really easy in functional programming. And the point that I'm going to, to stress here is about tests. So remember when I talk about hexagonal architecture, I told you that our impure functions are going to be in the I.O. layer. And this I.O. is in our boundary, so it's like the, the outer uh, layer of our application. It's safe there. Uh, so when we look to our code, we know where the bad things are, right? The bad things are in the third layer. They are pushed to, to the boundary. We know they are there. And that's really important to know where they are. Uh, OK, and there, there's a concept called isolation. What this concept means? It means that uh, a function is isolated if everything that she needs from the outside world is passed through it through arguments. So a function is isolated if everything it needs is passed through it through arguments. When I say that to you, I hope you remember about per functions because I just told you that we cannot mutate state. And uh, given that, all of a per function uh, needs is going to be passed through, uh, through arguments. I don't mutate anything. So it's really nice that pure functions are a subset of isolated functions. Uh, and uh, it's important to say it's a subset and not that you need to have pure functions to be isolated because, for example, I could say things to a database inside a function, but if I'm receiving the database as a, a, a parameter, it is still isolated. So that's the idea, like pure functions are a subset of isolated ones, but I can have isolated functions that are not pure. OK, so now we know that pure functions are a subset of isolated ones. OK, but here comes the problem for object-oriented programming. Isolation is like the dual of encapsulation. Because when I talk about encapsulation, I'm saying that uh, everything that uh, the outside world needs to know about an object is going to ask you it. So you need to ask me via gets, or you need to change things inside me via setters. So you don't know nothing about me, and everything that you want to know, you need to ask to me. Um, and when you say about isolation, it's like the, the opposite. I don't know nothing about the external world, and everything that I need, the external world needs to give to me. I don't know nothing, you just pass everything to me, and then I can answer that to you. And OK, so how am I going to deal with that? Because isolation gives me a lot of power. It's easier to test. I have the, the mocks and stubs really easy. I have the dependency injection. And if I'm doing object-oriented programming, encapsulation is a really important thing. I just cannot, like, I'm not going to use it. That's, that's not a thing. So different from uh, uh, functional programming, that uh, you are working in a subset, here uh, you are working in an intersection because you have isolation and you have uh, encapsulation and you want the best of both, so you need to find an intersection between them. But it's really hard to live in an intersection. It's way easier to live in a subset. You just write a function, okay, it's isolated. I don't need to think about it. But when I need to, every function that I write, I need to think about the balance of it, so it's going to be easier for me to test. It's really, really hard. And we know like uh, good practices in object-oriented programming, they're not that easy. We have like a lot of good uh, things to, to learn. Uh, about how we can do those things. We have books that are like 600 uh, long pages. So it's not easy. Something, someone new just enters in your team. How are they going to know what's the balance between encapsulation and isolation? Like, that's really, really hard to, to get. And that's just not a problem in functional programming. So that's really nice because if someone new just entered your company and they said, okay, you need to do functional programming, and the, the what you do, like, when you have a good functional programming design, you're just doing pure functions. So you're just doing isolated functions, and you're just going to have tests like given to you. Um, 
And that's really nice. And you realize another thing here that's really, really important is that hexagonal architecture in functional programming is natural. And why is it uh, natural? A uh, uh, really nice uh, language for you to understand that uh, it's Haskell. Because in Haskell, when you're writing our functions, it expects it to be pure. So if you're writing our function and you're going to compile it and it's not pure, it's going to say it's going to give you an error. So I said, OK. I thought I was doing a pure function, but it's not. The compiler is just telling that to me. And I wish it could be pure. So I'm just going to move that up. Uh, I'm going to move the fact up, and I'm going to create a pure function here. And they're just like all the time trying to push your pure code to the boundaries so you can, guess, so you can get as many pure functions as you can. Uh, and in the outer layer, you're going to at some time say, OK, this is an I.O. I need to have some pure function here. And when you're doing that, you're pushing your impure code to the boundaries. Remember that I just told you that in hexagonal architecture, the IO code stays in the boundary. So that's the reason that when you're doing good functional programming design, you're doing hexagonal architecture. You're doing parts and adapters and without realizing it. It's really, really natural. And for us, it was funny because we didn't know that in the beginning. Like six years ago when we started, we just thought it was a good uh, architecture. And after some time, we could realize that, that it's really natural to, to get in this architecture when you're doing functional programming, because you're just following the idea of having as less uh, impure code as you can, and you're going to push as much as you can to, to the boundaries. OK, this was a really nice discovery. But I just told you that we want to have as many pure functions as we, we can. Like, we want to be as functional as we can. And I told you that we had. Uh, I'll sum in pure code in uh, our second layer. So we are asking ourselves, are we leveraging functional programming to its max? And no, because I showed you, we had imperative code and side effects in our controllers. And it's not the best that we could do. We could remove that from our controllers. So we said, after some months, we decided, OK, let's try some experiment to, to change it. And why didn't we want to have imperative code in our controllers? First point, it's harder to reason about. So I'm going to show an example. Here, if we're going to call this function block, I'm going to call the card, the DB, and the producer, right? These are the, the arguments of my function. And I can return true here, right? I can just return true. Uh, we don't have an idea what happened inside that function. So I need to enter that function. And they say, OK, what's happening? I'm calling a function that's called datomic card update. Datomic is like a database. And I'm calling a function that's calling producer card starts change it. OK, so now I enter the function. And I see that I'm calling some uh, function that updates my database. And I'm calling a function that produces a new message. Uh, the problem here is wh why it was hard to reason about only when looking to the call of the function. Because here I have indirect output. I'm doing things inside the function. I'm not returning it. When I'm returning everything, I, have, I just have, the, uh, I have direct output. So my function doesn't do anything and returns everything uh, as an output. So since I don't have that, I needed to enter the function to understand what it's doing. OK, it's also harder to compose the imperative code. Why? For example, here I'm blocking a lot of cards, right? So imagine that I have an error here in the block when I call the block for a card DB producer. Imagine that I was blocking 10 cards. It failed on the, on the fifth one. So there are still five missing. And I didn't compose with the fact of cards block notify. So five were blocked, but they didn't call the notify function. And the other five were not blocked and didn't call the function. Oh, it's, it's at least better, because they were not in the intermittent state. Uh, I couldn't compose things because I failed in the middle. I was already doing the, the function. I failed something in the database, and I didn't uh, went to the end. And another thing here, I'm passing my infrastructure code to my controller. So it's harder to compose. I'm having the DB and the producer inside it. OK, also harder to test. I told you that we get mocks and stubs when you have dependency injection, but when I have this, I am talking about integration tests. So the integration tests, they're going to test a flow. Uh, and if a, a flow fails, I don't know exactly where it fails. Because if th that flow fails, it called 15 functions. So I don't have that accuracy that we want to have. We want to have integration tests, but not a lot of them. But since all of our controller functions are uh, 
imperative, we need to have a lot of integration tests. And they take longer to run, they take longer to write, they are harder to maintain. So uh, that's not what we're looking for. And that's the idea. When integration test fails, they just call a lot of functions. You have no idea where it, where it happened. And this feedback is lower uh, because, it's high, as I told you, it takes longer to run an integration test than a unit test. It's way uh, faster. It's and slower also to, to write and to maintain one. So we were looking for it, maybe not with the end trend test, but that's the parameter that you, you always see. But now we had that because since our second layer was uh, infected with impure code, we're having a lot of integration tests and not as many unit tests as we wish. And we were seeing that this was not uh, the best thing. So we are not having as many pure functions as we wish. Uh, we are not having uh, the test as fast and as accurate as we wish also. And it's harder to maintain a code that's not uh, pure. So we decided to try another approach. And the idea here was to use hexagonal architecture with dependency rejection. So what's the idea? The idea is that I want to decouple the decisions of my code from the facts. So when I have my function, I decided to do something, right? I decided to update a card in the database, and I decided that I wanted to produce a message to my message broker. But I don't need to run that. I just decided that I want to do that. I want, what I want to be able to decouple this intent, what I want to do from the real execution. When I decided to do those things, I don't need to execute at the same time. So imagine now that my function block card, now I'm just passing one argument to it, only the card. And when I call it, it has a return. And the return is going to be this map. And this map is going to have the data that are the things that I want to save or to change in the database. And it's going to be array with the, the, the schemas. What's the schema for that uh, card, for example? So I'm going to have here the, a map inside that array with the ID, with the status, all those things. And I'm going to have also an array with another map with the messages. What's the message I want to produce? What's the topic is going to be produced to all those things? So now, I don't, want, I don't need to enter that block card function to understand what was supposed to do. I'm doing nothing, it's a, it's a pure function, and it's returning the things that should do. But we, we can enter it, and okay, only receiving the card. What we're doing here, we're returning, we're calling these functions, the effects update and effects status, they're doing nothing. They're just creating these maps. They, those are all pure functions. So they are creating those maps, and they, they are returning them. So now I know what I want to do. I have the 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 effect for the update, I have the effect for the status change, but I didn't run it yet. Uh, they are also really easier to, to compose because now when I call the block card, it's not going to fail. Those are unit functions. It's pure. I'm just creating maps with keys and values inside. Uh, so it doesn't uh, fail and I have the fact that I can pass to the other function and compose. So I'm going to leave this function with the effects from the block and the effects from the notify. I didn't uh, change anything in the database or things like that. And then when they return, to the layer of the, the I.O., the one that started things. So maybe it was an HTTP call. So the first function is going to receive that in the end, and then it's going to really save things on the database. It's really going to produce this message, but it's going to be an atomic operation. Not like before. Remember that before in this function, it was not atomic. I was all doing all the blocks here, and I was not thinking about the other effects that I could have. Now I have all the effects that I want to do, and I'm going to run them in a single uh, uh, time. If they fail, everything's going to fail. And if they pass, everything's going to, to pass. And I, when I have this, I can, for example, even create a runner to know the order that I want to do things. Um, then you can do uh, a lot of things you want. And just another thing before going to that, here you could also use, like for example, TypeScript to put the types here. So it's even more powerful. When you look to that blocky function, like you can see what's going to be the return of those effects. For example, uh, I could put here that's going to return an effect of the type uh, block and the other is the effect of the type notify. So I 
can just look to, I look to the function, I look to the type and I say, okay, I know what that function is uh, supposed to do. Uh, you, just looking for these two things, you don't need to look to the code. You know everything that was uh, supposed to do. Because before you didn't have this power, you're just executing things. And now that you're returning data, you have the power to put types on it and to understand what the things should return or not. So closure, it's always says that data is really important. And now that we model our functions like that, we have data as first class citizens because we are not running things before they, uh, before we need them to run and they are flowing in our app. So we can look to those functions and really see what they are returning, what we were expecting from it. We are not losing data, uh, data that can be really meaningful when, when, when looking to those things. And now our second uh, layer, is completely pure, so we just gain a lot of unit tests and it just eliminated a lot of integration ones. So we still have integration tests for sure, but we have fewer than them because our second layer we uh, is all tested with uh, uh, unit tests. And the tests are, okay, I call this function, is the, the map of effects what I'm expecting for. And we have the controllers without the side effects. We became more expressive because as I told you, now we can even put the, the types uh, and check them in our uh, functions, things that we couldn't when we were being imperative. And we have a lot of pure functions, more than we had before. Uh, our tests are really fast because now we, have, we are writing unit tests for the second layer and it's way easier to maintain because we can get a lot more from that functions because they are not doing any direct, uh, indirect output. They are just returning everything that they should do. So that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Questions? So we were discussing here, you, were, uh, you mentioned that you got rid of all your end-to-end -end tests or track attempts at least. And, and, but then you also mentioned you still had some integration tests. We were wondering if you could provide us an example of integration test. Yeah, uh, for, just to be clear of what is the concept of I'm using our end-to-end test, we're like really going up with our servers. We're really calling the database. We're calling the, the producers. Our integration test, we mock everything. So we have a fake database, we have a fake HTTP call. We are, imagine, I'm just calling that entry point. So I'm calling that uh, HTTP, uh, like that uh, URL, and then all the flow is going to happen. But all this flow is going to use mocked database and mocked uh, producers and things like that. So they take a little to run, but they are way faster than when than they were really hitting the database and producing messages and things like that. No, the integrations ones, they just work inside the, the services. So it's only the flows that that service has. So I only call those uh, HTTP from E, and if I make uh, an out HTTP call, it's not going to make it. It's constrained to, to the service, the integration one. When you say that the controller layer returns a, a set of effects, what does the effect stand for? Is it, is it the, the, the data? Effects are everything that we are mutating. So if I'm sending an email in my controller, if I'm, when I was calling the Datomic card update, I was really hitting the database and updating the, the card. Uh, if I'm um, really producing a message, uh, those things that are really, I'm really mutating something. Uh, now that I get rid of them, I'm just saying, uh, for example, when I, mute, uh, when I do the update, I have a, a map of how I'm going to, to update that. So I'm just returning how I'm going to, to update, but I'm not executing anything here. It's everything pure. It's just, ah, if I do update, uh, the, it's going to change the status uh, key. So I just uh, grab that, that map, update the status and return it, but I didn't hit the database. It's even not, it was not a dependence. Uh, in my function. So the other function that gra that holds, like the first function that got called, that's the, the inside the IO, is going to hold all the dependencies for, for it and is the only one that really can call things. But, but you have like a, uh, in the end you have the, in the input output layer, you have to have a card update or something like that. 
mm -hmm. that, that understand what the data comes from the, the controller level and execute the, the execute of data later. Okay, and that's the last, so that's going to happen in the I.O., yeah. Anyone else? I think that's it. Thank you, everyone.